We're going to head into a discussion here of stateless and stateful filtering. And you know when the names of two things are this close in networking, we're going to see questions about it all over the exam. And as you'll see, it's very important information for real world networking as well. Now we've got two common firewall methods with huge differences. Now stateless filtering is also called static packet filtering, static filtering, or packet filtering. The packet filtering uh, terminology you may be used to already because you've actually already done some of this. You've worked with stateless filtering without knowing it was called that because when you use an ACL, that's what you're doing, you're packet filtering. And it's very common as we know to static filter packets based on one or more of the following. Well, we've done this before and we'll do it again. Source IP address or port number, destination IP address or port number, or even the protocol number itself. Now static filtering's main advantage is that it's relatively easy to implement and you don't need a specialized iOS version to run it or really anything else extra. You can sit down at the most basic of iOS's uh, and create an access list. So if you know, so you know by now if something's that good it's got to have some drawbacks, right? And there are some pretty serious drawbacks here. As compared to other firewall methods, uh, stateless filtering really isn't terribly bright. Uh, I shouldn't say that it's not bright, I should say it's not terribly adaptive because it's pretty much deny, permit, and that's it. There is no attempt to determine if that packet being filtered is part of an already existing connection or attempting to initiate a connection. And the first time I heard that, and it's probably the same question you're having right now, it's like, well, why do I care? Why do I care if a packet is part of an already existing connection or conversation or it's initiating one? Well, if a device on the inside of your network initiates a connection with a device outside the network, it is much more likely to be a legitimate non-threatening conversation than one that is started by an outside device. It's simply the odds. So we do care whether that packet is part of an already existing conversation or it's initiating a conversation because what we may choose to do with our firewall is say okay if a device on the inside of our network starts a conversation with a device outside the network we will allow the outside network device to reply but we will not allow the outside device to initiate the conversation. Again, it's something we may do, uh, but that's something stateless filtering isn't looking into. Now another issue with stateless filtering, there are applications that use random port numbers and or dynamic port numbers. With stateless filtering, it's likely that these applications are going to have some trouble operating. Now on, another, on that topic, uh, stateless filters really wreak havoc, for example, with FTP because FTP's operation involves access to randomly selected high numbered ports. And there's also no memory here. There's no list of previously seen IP addresses. Uh, so that leaves us wide open to IP spoofing attacks. And that is another issue with stateless filtering. Now, stateful packet filtering to the rescue, AKA dynamic packet filtering. Now, stateful packet filtering does monitor the connection state, and that is very important when it comes to preventing TCP-based attacks, and we'll see why in just a moment. Stateful firewalls operate at layers 3, 4, and 5, and they're not only going to monitor the states of your TCP connection, but also the sequence numbers. Basically, a stateful firewall will allow that internal host to start a conversation with an outside host, but outside hosts will not be allowed to start conversations with inside hosts. Now, how do stateful firewalls do this? What do they have that stateless firewalls don't? Well, stateful firewalls keep what we call a session table or a state table. And the state table is dynamic. So when conversations go quiet, they're actually on the way to being dropped. And inside that state table, we're going to have source and destination IP addresses and port numbers. We're going to see TCP and UDP flag settings, and we're going to have TCP sequencing information. Now let me ask you something. Why aren't we going to see information about UDP sequence numbers in that state table? Because UDP doesn't have sequence numbers, right? One of the first things we learned about UDP and TCP. Now, speaking of one of the first things we learned about TCP, let's quickly review that TCP three-way handshake. 
First off, the client initiates the communication with a send packet. Let me make that communication real quick. Love these erasable chalkboards. Um, then the recipient replies with a send ACK, and then the client replies with an ACK. Now, stateful filtering would not allow packet one to enter the network from the outside. We're not going to let an outside device initiate the communication. And it would only allow a packet with the ACK bit set if the session table indicates that an internal network host initiated the TCP handshake. I know it sounds like I'm really hammering this point home, and I am. It's a very important point with stateful filtering. Now also, TCP packets with sequence numbers outside an expected range would be dropped. And we know that this, the sequence numbers are kept in the state table, as I mentioned, TCP sequencing information, and there will be a pattern to those. And then all of a sudden, if the number goes whack, technical term, uh, if, if it's really uh, much larger or smaller than expected, then they would just be dropped. They'd be suspicious. Stateful filtering is also much easier on our FTP connections. And you know that in, from your NA studies, you know FTP runs over TCP, and that FTP uses one connection as a control connection and a separate connection for the actual data transfer. And that data channel is set up using a dynamically selected port number, and that's where stateless firewalls run into a problem. And a stateful filter will recognize that FTP data channel construction and will allow it to be completed. Now, one major drawback with stateful firewalls, nothing's perfect, right, is that they don't combat application layer attacks. And here's something that does. It's called an application gateway also a proxy firewall. Two names, same thing. When you vote by proxy, another person is actually casting your vote for you. With a proxy firewall, another device is connecting to an outside the network destination for you or perhaps not allowing you to connect. Because when a proxy application is installed on a server, that proxy server is the middleman between internal users and outside destinations. It's actually the proxy server that connects to the outside destination. And here's basically what happens. You know, first, your inside user attempts to connect to the outside destination. The proxy server is then going to receive that attempt, hold the attempt, basically saying, wait just a minute, and then itself attempts to connect to the destination if that destination is allowed. And the proxy server connects, gets the info the user, the inside user wanted, like say a web page, and then presents that information to the inside user. So information about that internal host is never revealed to the outside. And the entire process is very likely transparent to the inside user. It's pretty cool stuff. Now having proxy servers really allows you to tie down network access because the proxy server works all the way up to the application layer. And you're going to have the opportunity to have all the activity logs you ever wanted, uh, you know, and then some, frankly. Now, you've already likely guessed what the trade-off here is. That overall process sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it, for that proxy server? And it is, so you better have one powerful device handling that. But that is the basic operation of a proxy server. Now, when we come back, when we head to the next video, we are going to talk about zones and zone-based firewalls because this is one major way that we set up firewalls with Cisco. We're going to use zones. We'll talk about what those zones are, why we use them, and do some configuring in the next video. See you there.